The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. Consistently across the board, what Harris did has stuck. Uh, and very little of it is on the current political agenda for reversal now. Then, later on The Agenda. It's strange to come upon a phone in the middle of nowhere. For one moment, I thought, could this be an emergency situation? No, it was a phone to talk to the dead. Even though it's been almost 30 years since Mike Harris won the 1995 election and ushered in his so-called common sense revolution, you can still spark a pretty intense argument when you raise the name of Ontario's 22nd Premier. If you liked him, he was the guy who did what he said he was going to do. Cut taxes, balance budgets, and make government smaller. If you didn't like him, he was the guy responsible for deaths in Walkerton and Ipperwash. Alistair Campbell was one of Harris's senior most advisors, and he's put together a collection of essays designed to give the Premier's time in office a second look. The book is called The Harris Legacy, Reflections on a Transformational Premier, and it brings Alistair Campbell to our studio tonight. It's good to see you again. How are you doing? Uh, happy to be here. Excellent. Let's start with a little excerpt from the book. Uh, you write, it is not an overstatement based on the evidence accumulated in this collection of essays to say that we live in Mike Harris's Ontario today. And the concern that this legacy was both meaningful and perhaps unfairly maligned, or at least underappreciated, created the initial impetus for this editorial project. So let's start there, Alistair. Give us some examples of why you think we're still living, still living in Mike Harris's Ontario. So the, the book project ended up uh, kind of exposing a thesis, which was that in fact, despite the controversies of the time, almost nothing Harris did was reversed by his largely liberal successors. Uh, and so uh, the city of Toronto was not unmerged. The monolith of Ontario Hydro that uh, he blew up wasn't reconstituted. Uh, almost none of the 40 uneconomic small hospitals that he closed were reopened. The welfare rates that he meanly cut weren't raised back up by his replacements. The massive parkland expansion wasn't paved over. In fact, the Oak Ridge's moraine, which he protected, would be a vivid example. And current Premier Ford has just discovered that even that part of the Harris legacy is impossible to reverse. So, and there are numerous other examples that you give in the course of the book as to why you think we're still living in Mike Harris's Ontario. I should ask as the follow-up, did Mike Harris have any editorial influence in the publishing of this book? He did not. He was aware of the project. Uh, he saw it when it had been sent to a typeset. Uh, he had a couple of questions and comments about it. I think in general, he's pleased that it's a balanced perspective, but no, he had no control on the output. Was he upset with any part of it? I think he felt that uh, his former staffer, Guy Giorno, was a bit tough on him. His former chief of staff, Guy Giorno, wrote a fairly tough chapter on yeah. him. That's true. Yeah, he noticed that. <laughs> he noticed that. Okay. Was Mike Harris, in your judgment, the Ontario version of the Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher revolution? So the common sense revolution was definitely, at least in part, a drawing from the same motivations and ideological underpinnings that Thatcher and Reagan were kind of tapping into. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the legacy of Harris, I think, is actually a little bit, little bit more consequential. You know, Reagan taxes got cut, they went back up. Um, uh, Thatcher, some of the stuff that she privatized, people are now thinking was a mistake. Mm. Uh, but consistently across the board, what Harris did has stuck. Uh, and very little of it is on the current political agenda for reversal now. Would you say he is a neo ideologue as many of his critics thought? I don't think that's fair either. In fact, David Frum, in his nice little uh, uh, forward to the book, describes the common sense revolution as being uniquely a Canadian term, kind of like progressive conservative, or you know, conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription. We take things that are not normally reconcilable and turn them into kind of a compromised 
balanced and sensible way forward. Mm -hmm. And the common sense revolution, I think in many ways, was a logical succession to uh, Bill Davis' progressive conservatism. You know that Bill Davis's supporters think that's absolute hogwash. You know that, right? They, they, they do not see the two premiers as even being in the same party, even though technically they were. And so I think uh, uh, Premier Davis was always very supportive of Michael, as he called him. He did call him Michael. Uh, and I think uh, the time that Harris spent on the backbench watching Premier Davis and the Top Gun uh, Davis era cabinet ministers, the Darcy McHughes and the Frank Millers, Mike drew from all of that. Uh, and by the time he got to be Premier himself, he was a deep student of public policy. There was no file he didn't understand the stakeholder map on and have an opinion on. Uh, and those opinions might not have been exactly the same as those held by Davis era ministers. But in the end, uh, he ended up I think running uh, an Ontario uh, to a better place than it had been, which every premier hopes to achieve. Well, I would say for the record, when he ran in 1981 in that election, Mike Harris did have a keep Davis, Squadra Davis, for the French and Italian residents in his constituency. So he was running as a Bill Davis conservative in 1981. He absolutely was, and I don't think he ever apologized for that. Right. Okay, I want to take aim at one of the things that Mike Harris loves to portray himself as, and that is as a tax fighter. He loves his reputation as a tax fighter, and I wonder if it is as well-deserved as you and he think. Yes, he cut the provincial portion of income taxes by 30%, but he also brought in something in that same first term called the fair share health levy, which raised premiums, quote unquote, taxes on other people as well. So at the end of the day, Tell me why he wasn't just taking from one pocket and putting it into another. Yeah, so first of all, net, the taxes were lower in total. Uh, and second, uh, in fact, you should be applauding this as another vivid example of uh, aggressive conservatism. The fair share health care levy tilted as a surtax on higher incomes. And so it was a way of making sure that the tax cuts implemented had the most impact on those at the lowest income. Is it fair to say the budget would have been balanced more quickly had he not cut taxes as much as he did because you would have realized more revenues and therefore the books would have been more buoyant? So uh, we have an economist in the first chapter and the two fiscal uh, academic journalists in the second chapter who both tackled that. In the end, uh, Ontario's economic growth in the Harris era was disproportionately impressive relative to the rest of Canada and relative to the competing states in the US that have kind of the similar neighbor, neighborhood and industrial kind of mix. Uh, we outperformed them all. It's entirely possible to argue that the tax cuts helped create some of that economic growth. One more question before we get some other advice for you from the table here. In terms of the common sense revolution, after it was over, I mean, I, I, I point out, I put on the record that Mike Harris did get re-elected two consecutive majority governments. But after that progressive conservative era ran its course, the Tories were in the wilderness for 15 years. What do you infer from that? So I think, um, as we're probably seeing federally in Canada now, uh, Canada has a healthy instinct about time for a change. Uh, and in a democracy, it's often a good idea to switch governments over time. Uh, and I suspect that what was happening uh, when Ernie Eves lost, having uh, stepped in to replace Harris. We may have some differences of opinion on that front, as we will discover I would here. Hope so it's Canada. After there we all. go. There we go. Let's get into some more discussion going on about the Harris legacy. Joining us now on the line, let's welcome Sandra Pupatello. She was a Liberal MPP from 1999 to 2011, a former cabinet minister as well. And here in our studio, Marilyn Shirley, New Democrat MPP from 1990 to 2005 and a cabinet minister in Bob Ray's government. Chloe Brown is here, policy analyst at the Future Skills Center and a former two-time Toronto mayoral candidate. And Robert Benzi, the Queen's Park Bureau Chief for the Toronto Star. And Sandra, it's great to see you on the line from Points Beyond. Appreciate you being here. To our friends around the table here, it's great to see all of you again as well. Let's, uh, I want to start with a very neutral, lean, open-ended question. Sandra Pupatello, as you think back on the Common Sense Revolution years, what's the first thing that comes to mind? 
Well, I often think of Buzz Hargrove, to be honest, and the the uh, absolutely incredible way that he was able to muster protests. I don't think we've seen anything like it since. So that's the first thing I think of when I think of the CSR. Um, and I do appreciate everyone has a different perspective, but the way we lived and breathed those protests was the first time that I had seen riot gear and police at the precinct. Uh, and I remember uh, just being absolutely gobsmacked at what I was witnessing in my own province, which you ordinarily see on CNN somewhere, you know, in some far flung place. So I do think the era was marred by a lot of those protests and people who were maybe rebounding again from having argued with the NDP government, now arguing on the other side with the Conservative government. And I just remember our first term in office, um, all of our stakeholders had to realize, wow, maybe we don't have to fight after all. And we try to really just have a calm in the center. Um, but yeah, that's what I think of. Marilyn, I should ask the same question to you. And, and let's remember that the Harris government replaced the government that you were a part of and won in part by pledging to overturn much of what you had done in the five years you were in power. So how do you remember those years? Which they did. <laughs> and that was part of the common sense uh, revolution. And that, that's the reality of it. And I, you know, I have a different perspective. I do want to congratulate you on the book, by the way, because I think you put together some very interesting and diverse opinion writers, and I, I think that that goes a long way into just uh, in describing your view of the Harris years. But what I remember are all the cuts and deregulation. And of course, I remember Walkerton. I got into politics as an environmental activist. I still am. And I have to say at this point about Walkerton that one of the, the sections in the book says in reality the privatization of Ontario's routine testing for water was not the Har Harris government CSR target list. It said it was part of a plan introduced in 1993 by the Ministry of the Environment and the Ray government. The SRA reports, at best, this is disingenuous. It just is not true. Well, wait, wait a minute, it no. is accurate. Uh, no, because the NDP never privatized and, in fact, set up a crown corporation, which is very different from privatization. So I don't know why you say that's accurate. Because the water testing aspects of the public utility commissions that took place at that time was a process initiated by the NDP. Yeah, under a crown corporation. Okay, yeah. you want to come yeah. in on that? Uh, I will only say that uh, the chapter that's being cited here, uh, Gordon Miller was the environment commissioner first of such uh, appointed by Harris, but reappointed under McGuinty, uh, and I think Wynne, uh, and ran Green uh, in was the a last Green Party election. Candidate. So yes. uh, uh, we didn't pick a partisan uh, here. I understand for this that, topic. Alice, but, but I have to say that the NDP, it's foolish, if nothing else, to say that the NDP would have privatized water testing, and they didn't. It was a Crown Corporation. And, and and in 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 our first year, there were all over 600 plants that were inspected under this private under this uh, Crown Corporation. Um, they were inspected, whereas under the Harris years, I don't know, there was a third or something done. So this needs to be, shall I say then, to be fair, explored a little more. Okay. Because the NDP Point. never did privatize water testing and, in fact, did a great job with this Crown Corporation. Let me go to Robert Benzi then. You know that conservatives believe that you are part of uh, a kind of an axis of evil. There's the CBC, the Toronto Star, the public sector unions, which sort of were in cahoots to destroy Mike Harris, even from the second he took office. I just came back from the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, tell me, now that you've had sort of two and a half decades uh, of, of opportunity to kind of, and you, you know, you reviewed the book for your newspaper, yeah. to, to reconsider the Harris government's legacy, do you come to any different conclusions today about what you were reporting on two and a half decades ago? Not really in the sense that uh, I thought Alistair did a great job on the book. Uh, we gave it a full page in the Star when it came out uh, last fall. And it's because it's important that this kind of history is, is shared with Ontarians, shared with Torontonians. And I, th I think... Uh, I think there was good perspective in it. I mean, the chapter on Ipper Wash that, that Alistair wrote is very critical of Premier Harris, and the star was very creamer, critical of Premier Harris and the decisions that were made around the, the death of protester Dud Dudley George at Ipper Wash Provincial Park. 
you know, almost 30 years ago. That was a very, that was a seminal moment, I think, for Indigenous relations in this, in this province. And um, it certainly carried out throughout the time that Harris was Premier. When the Liberals came in, they had a, an inquiry into what happened uh, after 2003. So I think, I think at the time the star was critical of Mr. Harris and as a watchdog, but I think that, that the paper all, and I, you know, I worked for the National Post actually when Harris was, was Premier. Uh, I, I switched to the, to, to, uh, to the star when, uh, when Eves was Premier. But um, it, 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 I think that they were critical of him, but they took him seriously. And I think, I think he should have been taken seriously. And I, still, and I think Alistair's right that his legacy should be taken seriously because so much of what's happened since he left office has not changed. It hasn't been undone by Kathleen Wynne or Dalton McGuinty or Ernie Eves or Doug Ford. Let me do a quick follow-up on Ipperwash. Mm -hmm. Ipperwash happened, that whole protest. First Nations took over the park. It was a provincial park. It happened very soon after Mike Harris became Premier of Ontario. Do you think his lack of experience in the job as Premier contributed to to the disaster that that became. I think that's very clear. Uh, and as I tried to articulate in my editor's note on this, uh, I don't think any of us are too surprised that, you know, that what we were taught in school about Canada's history with regard to First Nations turns out not to have been the actual history. Uh, and that there is uh, uh, decades of unwinding and obligations that we will have into the future to try and address this. Uh, there's also no doubt that there's a better awareness of things like systemic bias and the idea that the OPP may have had some of that uh, is, I think, something we're, we all understand now. It happened during his time. But any leader has the obligation at a moment of crisis, you can either ramp up the tension or you could ease the tension. Uh, and Harris chose the wrong route on that day. Uh, at that meeting that was described over and over again in the inquiry. In which it, he said, get those effing Indians not clear out of the park. what he said. Well, uh, his attorney general the, said that's what the he tone, said. The tone wasn't healthy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the outcome uh, from that meeting was nothing. Uh, the tragedy happened during Harris, not because of Harris. But, uh, and that would be true, I think, of Walkerton as well. Mm. Uh, but in both cases, uh, it's part of the legacy and needs to be included in any discussion. Right. Chloe, I want to get you in here now. And I've left you for last purposely because while all the rest of us kind of live through this professionally, um, were you even born when, I, when Mike Harris got elected, <laughs> I should ask? I was in kindergarten and I'm born in 1990. Oh, you're born in 1990? Yes. So the year Bob Ray's government got elected. Okay. Yes. Well, the reason we wanted you here is that obviously your generation has inherited the Harris legacy and 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 I'm curious, I, I'm, I'm deputizing you right now as being responsible <laughs> for speaking for an entire generation of people who are right. your age. When you think of the Mike Harris years now, what do you think? Not happy in the slightest. One, th three things that I think about are rent control and the residential tenants act i think about the lt the olt which is the ontario land tribunal which is one of the worst places i had to actually go for a rent increase to fight it and i've never been so dehumanized so it's one of those things where it's like housing education we have a labor shortage in constructions the industrial arts that all happened because harris fired 10,000 teachers and that's something i will remember from harris's legacy saying goodbye to the shop teacher home economics the, my music teachers all these very in need skills that are absent in the labor market right now so that has a consequence in itself because we have a skill deficit that was created because of a choice to defund vocational education, the arts, and et cetera. And you, you blame the Mike Harris government for that? Yes, because 10,000 teachers is a lot. And when I think about working at Toronto Metropolitan University and the types of skills that are offered at universities and colleges right now, they're playing catch up with what was lost in uh, grade 13, the, the elementary school system. So that, that exposure to shop class created construction workers. With no shop classes, now you have a deficit of construction workers. Um, the industrial arts, which is skilled trades, is something that is constantly being funded by federal provincial governments but you're not getting people in it because you haven't changed the industry conditions um, then rent control i live in an apartment 
I have to live in an apartment that was built before 2018 because there's no rent control on any unit after that. Well, he didn't abolish rent control. No, but he gave us new builds. Yes, mm -hmm. but he gave us the Ontario Land Tribunal where privileged homeowners can go to stop building low income housing. When I was a kid, I grew up in a public housing apartment complex. Those haven't been subsidized or supported since the Harris government. Now we have a backlog of housing for everyone. And then the third thing is comparing our nurses to hula hoops, the hula hoop makers or whatever. <laughs> that comment made the book. <sighs> yeah. It's frustrating because as we deal with this mental health crisis, and I think about the fact that every conservative government refuses to pay the staff to get the training and the expansion of community and home-based care that we need, we have a mental health crisis that's spilling out in the streets. Combine that with the housing crisis, we have a homelessness crisis that is really playing out into some violent outcomes for the rest of us. So while I, I will not squarely put this on Harris's shoulders, his style of neoliberalism and his really good execution of those ideologies is what has us here. And I would critique common sense revolution by saying, Common sense is only common around the people you commonly surround yourself with. If you're not outside that circle, that common sense is not translatable. And as a working class person, that his common sense did not translate to the realities that I face even now as an adult. Um, Sandra, you and I both well remember that the opposition politicians of the day often tried to portray Mike Harris as sort of this dumb golf pro from North Bay who kind of didn't understand Toronto. But as it turns out, you know, if you take the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, the National Ballet School, uh, Royal Conservatory of Music, I mean, his government made huge investments, maybe unprecedented investments in those institutions. Did you guys misjudge him on that score? I think that when I have to reflect the way he was being portrayed as some golfer from North Bay, I think that was wholly unfair. I never met him until I met him when I was elected in 95. And the instant I met him in person, I knew exactly why he had been elected as premier and not Lynn McLeod in that election. He he really did have a common touch. I have to I have to give him that. Um, I will put the the benefit of all of those investments and endowments into the arts probably at the feet of Isabel Bassett, who was very influential uh, in Mike Harris's government. And I think she was a huge proponent for the arts. And that did actually come through her when she was Minister of Culture. And we used to watch that pretty intently that uh, she was very quiet, but she was very influential. Um, so I, I don't think that would have been his reasoning for going into politics for sure. Um, and I am interested in hearing all of this commentary when we reflect back. Um, there was always the instant where we're not going to get the toothpaste back in the tube. And we kept having Having to use that phrase because it, it exactly described our issues. When a hospital is closed, it's really, really tough to reopen. Um, once you've gotten rid of certain levels of something, it's very hard to institute because A, it takes a lot of money. And when we were elected in 2003, books weren't balanced. They were far from balanced. And I know every government says that, but I kind of mm. didn't expect that from that crowd that we had taken the government from. Um, we did fight some of those items in court and lost, uh, like the 407, where we did try to take it back into public hands. We failed. We tried. Um, you, you know, even minor items that for some uh, were a big deal, like the squeegee kids. I remember that vividly. Um, just recently this week, I think, another group attempted to switch the, pro the policy and failed at court. So uh, there were a lot of attempts, I think, um, by many governments since Mike Harris days to try to get back. Um, it would be kind of interesting that you would go back and tear apart the mega city of Toronto. Notice that nobody locally is asking for that, even though years later, they never did find the savings that they purported to have because of the mega city. Right. So it is interesting that many sort of moved on to the issue of today, as opposed to refighting those fights from back in the day. But Rob Benzi, I, I mean, I note, I mean, all of what Sandra said is true. Once you close a hospital, it's really hard to build it up again. But the Harris government cut welfare rates by more than 21% which still left them 10% over the average of the other provinces in Canada. None of the governments subsequent to the Harris government raised the welfare rates back to what they originally were, 
What do you infer from that? Well, Sandra was the minister at, 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 charged with trying to raise those rates right after. So remember, Sandra, the computer system that you inherited from the Tories didn't didn't allow for a welfare uh, raise. Oh, ben, and it was a yeah, huge, ben, see, huge I'm, issue. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you, but I can tell you that we had to spend $10 million just on an IT system to allow to change the rate. And that's frankly why we weren't able to change the rate instantly. And it took us at least that first year before we could start start to move that rate forward. But we did move it forward, albeit it did not go back to the levels that it was. Yeah, and, but Steve makes a good point, and, and I think that was one of the great themes of, of Alistair's book, of the essays in Alistair's book, is that, I, I don't know if it's toothpaste comes out of the tube, or also governments, I mean, when Dalton McGinty came in, there were some things that he could have done that he didn't do, and I think he didn't do them because he thought it wasn't worth the hassle, and he figures the pain has already been inflicted. Mm -hmm. Harris has absorbed the political damage, the Liberals can then benefit from, you know, if they if there was a benefit, and I think there was some. I mean, it's uh, things that uh, that McGinty did that 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 uh, Ford hasn't undone. We have full day kindergarten still. Ford didn't undo that. We have the HST still. Ford didn't deharmonize the sales they're, tax. They're not building new coal plants in the province. The, no one's building new coal plants. <laughs> uh, the and now and and Harris and it's in the book. Uh, the, the the first coal plant was actually started closing under Mike Harris mm -hmm. in Nanaimo uh, right. in, in uh, Lake Lakeview. Which is now Mississauga. Of course, Mississauga and poor credit. Yeah. Um, but so I think there's a lot of, I mean, there's almost like a continuum of government in in this province. Uh, I mean, there was some things that that yes, that Maryland's government did that Harris undid, but they got elected to undo those things. Okay, Marilyn, you want well, to raise something else? Yeah, I do, and I I think what was missing from the book, and I recognize that that it was a book to, in my view, perhaps rehabilitate Mike Harris a bit. What was missing, and, and this is really important, and Chloe, you touched on it, is that some of the policies around, for instance, stopping building social housing, and in fact, not building it, but stopping about 17,000 units that were already in process or almost in, pro in process, and downloading social housing to the city of Toronto and downloading other things, knowing that the city couldn't, all they could do is raise taxes, no other way to raise money without provincial consent. Um, the Safe Streets Act, the cutting the welfare, if you combine all of these and making it easier, rent control you brought up, so I won't go in it, into it again, but if you put all of those in a package and they're not identified in the book as real problems that exist today, and I think I can argue that, you know, these cuts against mostly poor people has contributed to our housing crisis and our homelessness crisis today. Let me get Alistair on that. There's no question you guys gutted social housing development, right? Correct. And the impact of which uh, is feeling is being felt today. And, Do you and agree? Flagged uh, it by Ginny Roth in in her chapter around municipal reform very explicitly. So but, was it a know, mistake to kill those programs? I don't know that it was a mistake at the time. We now face uh, a series of issues that new governments like. There's never no issues, uh, and so there's always going to be things to fix in any system. And Chloe's given a pretty good list of them. Uh, and I think the reality is that every new government is accountable for the facts as they inherit them. And some of them will have been caused by errors before. Some of them will just be the way the world's unfolding. Uh, and so this book what, isn't about prescribing the solutions to the social housing and homelessness issues we face today. Those are complicated and multi-government, uh, multi-generational issues. Mm. Uh, so yes, they should be fixed. I would like us all to weigh in and finish on this here. And uh, Sheldon, I'm on page five. Let's go to that last board, board number three there, uh, which we call, uh, why do they still hate him so much? <laughs> so here we go. Why do the critics of Harris hate him so much? He seems a nice enough fellow and is and was clearly well-intentioned, yet the blind and impassioned hatred comes through. Thoughtful groups that would never descend to ad hominem attacks in other areas seem to lose their judgment and restraint when it comes to Mike Harris. Now that's from a chapter written by Will Falk, who's a lifelong member of the Liberal Party. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, okay, Robert, why don't you weigh in first? Why do you think all these years later there's still a chunk of society that when you mention Mike Harris's name still froths at the mouth? I think because he did a lot of things and they remain top of mind. I mean, Steve, we're sitting a few blocks from the Eglinton 
Crosstown, which is still under construction and is very late. Mm -hmm. Mike Harris stopped the Eglinton subway that Maryland's government started building, filled in the tunnel, which to my, to still, to my mind, and I made a point in my Star article that this wasn't something that was tackled in the book, um, I still don't understand why they did that. Because it well, was short-sighted. they didn't money for it. But filling in the tunnel was just, it, was, it, almost, seemed, it almost seemed like, a, <laughs> that almost seems like a van, an act of vandalism. And Doug Ford is spending all of his political capital right now building transit. And it has been critical of the Harris government for those kinds of things. So it's those kinds of those kinds of things. But I think it's mostly because he was a, uh, a substantive premier. He did things, and people had opinions of them. Like Pierre Trudeau was a substantive prime minister, and is still a polarizing figure to this day. Sandra Pupatello, what say you? I actually think that we should have taken a page out of Bill Clinton's book, as it didn't matter that he also introduced welfare and work for welfare, if you recall. But every time he did something that was controversial, he would feel your pain. So he knew that there were people that were going to be hurt by what he was doing or, you know, uh, there would be unintended consequences of new policies. And he would always at least feign some kind of sympathy. Mike Harris never did that, and nor did his cabinet. And I think that was a good lesson. It was certainly a lesson for me in opposition at the time that you have to be genuine about what impact your policies have and at least give people the opportunity to, to listen to them. And I always felt that they, they could have gone further or they would have done better uh, had they at least taken the time to speak to people. They were in such a rush to bring things in. They kind of ignored the consultation and kind of made fun that, you know, governments consult too much. Well, there's a reason that people do consult, because even those wildly opposed to what you're doing, every now and then come up with some really good solutions for you. Chloe, how about you? Your generation? Why does that Mike Harris name still get spit out by so many? Mike Harris made being blue collar feel like a bad thing. Needing social housing, needing investments in your public school, it made you feel like a second-class citizen, and you started to feel it once he pulled those supports out of neighborhoods like Rexdale. I grew up in the Northwest Corridor of Toronto, and one day I grew up in Etobicoke, the next day I was in Toronto. And I felt it because they took instruments out of my school. They shut down certain classes because now we had to fundraise for certain extracurricular and supports that we needed. I was selling cookie dough at the age of nine because I wanted to take piano lessons that were now canceled because our music teacher couldn't stay after school because there was no funding. So it really made you realize that because you're blue collar and your parents are blue collar, you need government assistance. And that's bad because you shouldn't be asking for a hand up hand out. Meanwhile, in working class communities, a hand out is something that you embrace. The government made it seem like a bad thing to be a part of a community. And if you weren't a rugged individual, you deserve poverty. And that's why a lot of our generation will not remember him kindly, because it not only affected us as kids in the school, but it really dented the morale of our parents because now they had to take extra time to pay for these individual services. So no more private tutoring at school, you gotta go to Kumon. If your parents can't take time off of work to take you to Kumon, you don't get that extra math help, you start to fail. And now this is what's happened to our generation. It's just, we know that we deserve better, but we don't trust the government to give us better. Marilyn Shirley. I think both Chloe, uh, Chloe and, and Sandra put it very well. You know, the premise of the book is basically, to me, is that because none of those uh, policies were changed by, uh, by governments after the fact, that therefore it's a pretty good measure that it was good policy. I think that's a pretty thin uh, excuse, a thin argument, because I think other governments could have do done more. Not everything, Sandra, I agree, it was complicated. But these kinds of things, government, I, I just think it's because they lack the, I mean, the courage. You are going to say something <laughs> no, else. No, 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 You no, almost no, got no. through this whole show no, without no, swearing, no, no. unlike no, the last time you were here. You do not have the courage yeah. to do it because some of these things, let's face it, were popular with the larger population. Yeah. Okay. De demonizing Let poor people, blaming them for the deficit and all the problem. And I think problems, and I think that's why there's such a hatred for Mike Harris. Let me give the last word to Alistair, and in doing so, I was intrigued to read that Mike Harris was asked, if you had to do it all over again, what would you have done differently? And he <laughs> said, I would have gone harder, faster. Yep. I know. I call that a mic drop. 
<laughs> two ways, yes. I Pun think, intended. Uh, so, so much to think about in, in the intelligent comments that have been uh, made here. So I would just remind folks how dire the situation was in Ontario at the time. Record-breaking deficits. We hit a ceiling on how much we could tax. We hit a ceiling on how much we could borrow, and we received massive cuts in healthcare and welfare transfers from the federal government as part of them doing the same house cleaning that we had to do here in Ontario. And you didn't bitch about and it either. And we accepted those reductions and got to work. There were short-term consequences, undeniable. But the net result uh, on the welfare side that I think is most profound is that we had a million three on welfare in a province that was not yet 11 million people. It was uh, a recession, a it was terrible awful, recession. Maryland. Can't help and, it. Uh, we then <laughs> outgrew all the jurisdictions we're competing against, and the welfare caseload fell yes. every month from June when we announced the welfare compensation reductions. They started falling even before we cut. And they continued to fall to 500,000. They fell every month thereafter. The best solution to how painful welfare is, is a job. And Mike Harris's revolution contributed to economic growth and job creation at record-breaking levels. And so you can take a look at the whole legacy. He had to do difficult and challenging things, but he did, as I think Robert has said, highly consequential things. Uh, and there is only a short list of politicians who actually do things that last, that mean something, that matter. And Harris did more than most. And as a result, he will have a legacy of both positive and negative, but he will have a legacy. And I think that's the important part about this book. I think the one thing we have consensus on here is that we're glad that you put together the Harris legacy because it's given us all an opportunity to have a conversation about one of the most uh, interesting and fascinating times in Ontario history. So Alistair Campbell, thanks to you for getting that done, if I can use an expression of the Premier of the day. And to everybody else, Robert, Marilyn, Chloe, Sandra, out of town, thanks so much for being with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Next up, we travel to Acton and Guelph, where we look at an unusual tool that helps process grief. It's a phone that doesn't actually call anyone. One day I was walking along the pond path and it goes into the, into the forest and it's just quite magical in there. And it's just wandering around, just kind of mesmerized by the trees. And then off to the right, there's this booth this little thing and there's a phone like the old school phone with the rotary it's strange to come upon a phone in the middle of nowhere for one moment i thought could this be an emergency situation no it was a phone to talk to the dead I have been working with people who are dying for my entire career. So I would say I've probably worked with thousands of people at the end of life as a music therapist. And so when I picked up the phone, I, I was like struck by who would I want to hear from? Who would I want to interact with? Um, where are you? How has it been? You know, I, I was sort of flooded by a memory of a, a lot of different people. It looks like the life that I shared with mom and dad for so many years. My name is Catherine Manning and I'm a music therapist and I live and work in Guelph, Ontario. So I work at Hospice Wellington, which is a beautiful hospice facility offering um, 10 beds and end of life support for, for folks with wonderful nursing and healthcare support. I'm Linda, Linda Clark. Uh, I live here in Guelph. I'm Peter and Jerry Clark's daughter. I came upon Keith's wind phone in June of last year. And uh, even though my parents died six years ago, Grief is ongoing, and uh, the wind phone was a really sweet and important part of that. Well, I think what's really neat about the wind phone is that uh, it's, it's an access point for an expression of grief or to externalize our grief. They provide an avenue to interact with our grief. Um, I, I have a sense of them being um, like a side door to uh, encounter feelings that we have around the losses that we have. In the wake of a death, people are in an altered state. Having opportunities for encounters with nature, beauty, aesthetics, the arts, 
um, and the wind phones, it's something of a symbolic intermediary as something that you can interact with through another means. What's difficult sometimes with grief and bereavement or with losing somebody is that to look at it straight on is very difficult, especially when you're in that state of shock or a raw state um, afterwards. A wind phone in the woods is really uh, an interesting invitation. Uh, first of all, being in the woods opens your senses. It allows you to enter into a bit of a different space, a liminal space, where all of the old rules don't apply and it allows you to touch base with um, the deeper mystical side of life. When you lose somebody, there's an ephemeral quality to the, to the loss. It's very helpful in the process of adjusting to that new reality to have tools or practices that allow you to interact with the shift. So there's a feeling of walking away from regular world, regular life. There is that physical beauty of these trees that go higher and higher. And it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. For my mom, not unusual for women of her time, the phone was her lifeline forever. So many of the memories I have of mom are sitting at the table talking on the phone, picking up the phone. Who am I talking to today? My father was always, okay then, <laughs> handing it over to somebody else. But it was that phone and there was, there was a feeling of familiarity, which is lovely, actually lovely. My name's Keith Lamont. Uh, we're at Thistlestone Farm. I've uh, been here for 45 years. For that time, it's been a sheep breeding operation in our home. And for the last 10 years, also we host uh, guests who come and stay with us. So I installed the wind phone this past March. And uh, I had read about a Canadian physician on the prairies. She sponsored one on a trail for the benefit of her patients. She thought they might embrace this opportunity to pick up a phone and talk to somebody. My wife and I, in 1979, were working in jobs in the city, and we embraced the opportunity to come here and put this farm to use. In around 2005, my wife entered, at about 51 years of age, uh, into the start of young onset dementia. And for about 10 years after that, she was able to continue to live here. And for the last three years of those 10, I had PSWs before Mary entered into a long-term care center and died in 2022. So uh, this wind foam was around the diagnosis time when life is full of turmoil. If I'd discovered something like that on my own, I would have just let loose to that. That's all past for me because there's a lot of ambiguous loss times when you're losing another aspect of that person. This is a new endeavor for me and I did some exploration when I discovered about wind phones. The original in Japan goes back a while and I didn't realize there was so many wind phones. I understand there's one in Guelph and there's one in Mississauga and there's one here and there's one in a small village. They're for the public just to pick up and use as they're walking by in a public space. I don't advertise the fact that wind phone's there. I want people just to discover it. So all the reward for me for this is now hearing people's response to discovering the wind phone. When I came upon Keith's wind phone, I was astonished, would be the first, the first word. I was astonished. Um, the trees were what a friend of mine would call cathedral trees. It's a very uh, quiet, secluded spot. So I was curious. I was shy. I looked around. I was reluctant because I knew there's not going to be anybody at, on the other end. But uh, when you lose somebody, you keep wishing that you'd hear their voice or you catch a glimpse of them. And there's always a little part of me that's listening for something like that. So I looked around and there was nobody there and I thought, okay, I'll just try this. And I got up and I read the, the uh, engraving and, um, and it was lovely and I, and I picked it up and of course, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, of course, on the other end. And I thought, oh, this is, this is stupid. And I hung up and I walked away. And a couple of days passed. Uh, we were staying at Keith's farm. 
And I thought, go back to the wind phone and have an open mind, see if something happens. So I retraced my steps, um, again appreciating, and even now remembering it, appreciating the sounds, the top of the trees and the smells of the forest and all the rest of it. And I stood there in front of that phone and I picked it up and I spoke and I said something. Actually, I remember very well what I said. I said, hi, mom and dad. It's Linda. We're all fine. We're all fine. We sure miss you. Uh, we wonder if you're okay. Um, gee, I wish you could come back and tell us we had done a good thing. Uh, love you. Bye. And then I walked away. It stimulated memories that I hadn't thought about for a long time. So the wind phone really does work. It brings you back to places with the loved ones that you're thinking of. And for me, it was mom and dad. Um, and all sorts of memories came back and all sorts of images, um, joyful, the difficult ones, all those ones came back. And you realize, ah, that's what the wind phone is for. It's to connect us in that way. I knew that it wasn't going to quote unquote cure my grief. There's no cure for grief. Time changes it, but time doesn't take it away. Um, my grief is as familiar to me as my hand is. The education around grieving is minimal. And I mean, we all experience it. And somehow when we experience it, it segregates us. Shouldn't you be over that by now? It makes me smile and occasionally giggle that, you know, I was in the middle of the woods at our friend's farm and I was laughing because I was using the phone to talk to my parents and I knew they weren't there, but it was important to me. So it's really touching on something that we need. Uh, and, and maybe, I mean, I'm not a person, I'm not a religious person. I don't go to church and all the rest of it. Perhaps that's what, what's lacking, is that uh, ritual that goes around saying goodbye to people that we love. At this year's Rural Ontario Municipal Association Conference, I spoke with Pamela Cross and Krista Lowry about why more and more communities are considering intimate partner violence an epidemic. Have a look. In 2022, a coroner's inquest was held into the 2015 murders of three women, Natalie Warmerton, Anastasia Kuzik, and Carol Culleton in Renfrew County, a rural part of Ontario. And that inquest looked at what happened that we could change so we aren't going to see these kind of deaths again. It was the first time there had been a domestic violence homicide inquest that focused on rural communities. I'm Pamela Cross. I'm the Advocacy Director at Luke's Place in Durham Region. Why do you think it's important gender-based violence is declared an epidemic in Ontario? The very first recommendation from the jury in the Renfrew County inquest was to declare intimate partner violence or IPV to be an epidemic. And I can tell you when, when we heard that recommendation read out by the foreperson of the jury, we all just gasped because it is brilliant. It says clearly and directly, we are taking this problem seriously. This is a public policy issue. This is a public health issue. And then when we saw municipalities on their own, because that recommendation was directed at the province, say, hey, we're not waiting for the big guys to do it. We're going to say it's an epidemic in our community because it is. Our shelters are full. They're overflowing. Women are living on the street because they've got nowhere to go. It meant so much to survivors and to advocates. And so it's so fantastic that we're at almost 100, but there's more than 400 municipalities in the province. We need to keep going. It really came through the relationship we have with our local shelter, Lanark County Interval House. Uh, the executive director there is Erin Lee. She has um, a very strong team. My name is Krista Lowry and I'm the mayor in Mississippi Mills. Um, so we get regular updates. It's, it's very common for um, Interval House to come and present at our, uh, at our county table or at the lower tier tables. And it was a regular update that, that we were receiving from, uh, from the executive director. And, and I remember um, Aaron saying, you know, if I can just leave one thought with you, consider 
declaring int intimate partner violence an epidemic. But she put it out maybe as a challenge and wasn't expecting us to say, can we just take a recess? Can you help us with some wording? We'd like to do that tonight. And I don't know that she was expecting for that to happen. And on the other side, I wouldn't say Lanark County Council was perhaps expecting there to be as many communities follow suit. Um, we're thrilled that there has been a conversation gained because of that action. You hope to do that sort of, um, to have that kind of impact when you pass resolutions and you pass them up to, to AMO or to the province and whatnot. You hope that you will have that opportunity to encourage discussion, encourage um, conversations and try to move along a, a, an issue. Uh, there's a long way to go on this issue. Intimate partner violence is a municipal issue because it's happening to our neighbours, to our friends, to our family members, to our work colleagues, to people who go to the same religious institution that we go to. And there's a lot that we can do at the community level to make this an issue that we talk about, that we're not afraid of, that we say is something we're pulling out of the shadows and, and making a public issue. Guidance or leadership and, and certainly financial resources from the province and from the federal government, critically important. But those conversations can and should start at the community level. Municipal issues of roads and bridges and infrastructure and libraries, you know, those kinds of things. So purely it isn't a municipal issue, but it is absolutely community safety issue. And that's where it does fit in with our responsibilities to our community. Uh, it fits into our community safety and well-being plan that's adopted at the county level and also at all the, the lower tier level. And we do reflect uh, intimate partner violence, violence against um, women, gender-based violence in our safety and well-being plan. So purely, no, it doesn't fit municipal responsibilities. Does, does it fit with the community? Absolutely. It affects our communities. It affects the, the residents and families in our communities. It affects the safety in our communities. And as elected officials, we're also community leaders. We're community builders. And we have the opportunity to influence change, influence discussions that are had. And for that reason, it's a municipal issue. How can neighbors make a difference? We can all make a difference. Lanark County has this fantastic project called, or campaign really, called See It, Name It, Change It. We have to stop turning our faces the other way when we know or think we know that someone is being abused or someone is causing abuse. Of course, we have to proceed carefully and cautiously. We don't want to make it worse for that survivor. We don't want to put ourselves in a place of danger. But there are resources out there to help us. So we do need to see it, name it, and change it. A program called Neighbors, Friends, and Families, all of their material is online. They're just about to launch a brochure that's specifically about intimate partner violence in rural communities. It's a really good guide. What should I be watching for? And when I see some of those red flags, how do I talk to her in a way that's safe for her and safe for me? So when we put our community safety and well-being plan um, together, it's a community-driven plan. Um, it is very much supported in behind by government, by the local winter government and the lower tiers, the local government too, but it's very much community-driven. And so because of that, there's been some programs identified by the people on the, like right in the in the work. Um, councils are not right in the work. We need to rely on the experts and those who are on the front lines to say, you know what we really need is a victim advocate program. And so that's one of the things that has come through. There's also a, a mobile crisis uh, unit that is part of the OPP. So it's a mental health nurses who are uh, responding with them. So the right people are on the call, depending on what that call might look like. Uh, so those are, those are two that come to mind right off the top because they were directly coming from the work of those who are on the front lines and saying this is something that we need. Um, another that came out, it's not a its not a program, but it was a campaign, um, the uh, See It, Name It, Change It campaign, and that largely was coming to us from the, um, the Interval House team. Uh, and we've adopted it. You'll see it on billboards on the highways. Uh, we all have bookmarks and whatnot with it, t-shirts on it, like it's something that we've all adopted. How did COVID change this issue? Those of us who work with survivors of gender-based violence, in particular intimate partner violence, we anticipated that COVID would have an impact. We had no idea that rates of violence would go through the roof. 
And when you think about it, it's actually not that hard to figure out why. All of a sudden, we were all living under stay-at-home orders. And so for women who were already in relationships where they were being abused, they had nowhere to go. They weren't going to work. Their partner wasn't going to work. The children weren't going to schools. They couldn't take the kids to the library to get a bit of a break. They couldn't go visit their elderly mother because we were all told to stay in our little clusters. That's why it happened. The rates went way up. Shelters had to cut their capacity, I think, in about half because of the, the physical distancing requirements. So women had nowhere to go if they were ready to leave the relationship. And we're still in that state where we haven't recovered from that yet. So there are certainly issues that are compacting, making it more difficult in rural communities versus urban communities when we're looking at gender-based violence or intimate partner violence specifically. And it's the kinds of issues that are affecting all kinds of uh, matters in rural places. So things like transportation. Um, if you can't step out of your home and get onto a bus and take you from a situation that you're not safe in, that's not the reality in most rural communities. There's not transportation. You may have your neighbor be two kilometers down the road. So that's one of the barriers. That's one of the challenges. Uh, certainly connectivity has come a long way, but there's lots of areas. And I don't even want to say pockets. It's cargo pants worth of pockets of, of places that still don't have reliable connectivity. So if you can't pick up the phone and say, I need help, I need to get out of here, or make your plans or whatever it might be. So that's certainly something that a lot of rural communities are um, still very much facing as well. Um, and I think the nature of being in a small place, um, there's the sense that everybody's in your business or could be in your business. There's not the same sense of anonymity. Um, and there can be um, an extra layer of difficulty in leaving because people will know every, what will everyone think, you know, that kind of thing. But then the other side of it too, is it safe? You know, is it safe because of uh, how easy it is to know what's happening in small places? So there's extra layers absolutely in, in small places, in rural places. I think from my experience in Lanark County, the benefit also of being in a rural place is there's such a sense of neighbors wanting to help neighbors. Uh, there's such a sense of wanting to support everybody in, in our community and making sure that everybody is okay. So there is that sense too of wanting to make sure that, you know, you wrap your arms around everybody and we're gonna make sure everybody is safe. Tomorrow on the agenda. Grief can have a very complicated nature, it can be ongoing, and it can, um, it can take different forms. And I think that that's something that we've all learned with COVID. That's tomorrow on the agenda.